Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning into this show. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about what can you do to incorporate more pleasure in your life and also what you can do to feel better in your skin. In the last two weeks, we had two wonderful guests that they taught us what we can do on a daily basis to connect with our body better and show up more present during sex. Today, we're going to continue talking about that conversation, but we're talking about it from a different angle. So what do you think when people talk about self-care? We all heard about it's really important as a professional to engage in self-care, do things that makes you feel good. And usually when I go to conferences, when they talk about self-care, they talk about perhaps having a hobby like knitting or taking a walk or taking a bath. And all, all of these are can be wonderful, wonderful self-care activities that you can do, but it's not necessarily talking to everyone. For me, excitement and adventure is a big part of what I'm looking for in self-care activities. I feel like our daily life can be very demanding. It could be very, at times, boring. So when I think about self-care, I think about all this exciting thing that I can do that makes me feel alive. So our guest is going to talk to us about BDSM as a form of self-care. When I heard first about it, I was like, I was kind of confused about how can that be a form of self-care? I guess I was curious, but Elizabeth attended this presentation that she had and she talked about how she widely used it as a form of uh, helping people to increase their body acceptance. She helped people to kind of use it as a form of self-care and help people to cultivate a positive body image using BDSM and this form of sexual expression. So uh, stay tuned. This is a fantastic conversation. Elizabeth Newsom, LCSW, is a sexuality intimacy therapist educator specializing in working with individuals who identify as kinky and or consensually non-monogamous, those who identify as gender non-conforming and or have questions about sexuality as well as those who need assistance with mood-related issues and many more. I leave a link to her full bio in the show notes. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Elizabeth Newsom. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited to have Elizabeth Newsom, LCSW, on our show today. Elizabeth, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Uh, as I was sharing with you, and I talked about it in the introduction, that I c- attended your presentation at a conference, and it was like about two of my favorite topics, <laughs> <laughs> sex and self-image and body acceptance. I was like, oh my God, this is wonderful. I have to invite her to our show. So I know you talk about how you use BDSM as a tool to help people reach body acceptance and work through some of the challenges that they have as it relates to their body and shape. Tell us, like, how can one use BDSM as a form of self-care? So there's actually a lot of ways (laughs) to use it as a form of self-care. A lot of the clients that I see in my private practice have a history of trauma, various self-injurious behaviors, And so a lot of my clients actually have already naturally sort of gravitated towards BDSM because it's a more socially acceptable means to get the same kind of endorphin releases and things like that that they would get to do things like self-injury. So part of why it's more acceptable is that when someone is doing something self-injurious or self-destructive, there is no, there's really limited insight and there's not planning and consent is not really, and that sounds kind of silly, you know, it's my body, I should, well, I'm doing something to it, I'm really consenting, but really you're not a lot of the times. Thus the cognitive dissonance and the internal anxiety and shame and what have you that comes with these kinds of things. Whereas when you are practicing BDSM, you are negotiating, you know, what's going on with your body. It's not done 
whatever's going on is not being done as a means of um, punishment, even when it is punishment. Um, <laughs> that punishment is still negotiated and it's not done from a place of rage, you know. And so I, I like to encourage people to explore that if pain is something that, that speaks to them. But then also as a form of self-care, BDSM can also, depending on what you're practicing, because BDSM is a giant, beautiful thing. But so depending on what you're practicing, BDSM can be a great source of finding mindfulness. Um, a lot of my clients really struggle with being able to focus enough to do things like meditation and yoga and all kinds of good for your soul kind of stuff. But when you start getting into some of the BDSM and some of the, the physical pieces that go with that, it really helps realign and refocus people so that they're better able to do things. And I mean, there's like, I could go on about this for like a really long time. <laughs> so I love it. I love the reframing. I love that how you're talking about that it's quote unquote traditional way of self-care is not speaking to everyone. Because I, at times when I talk about doing pleasure by activity to people, like they say, we don't, we don't necessarily like yoga. We don't necessarily like lighting candles. So as you're saying that, I don't think it's necessarily one way that we can, people can promote and kind of practice self-care and BDSM. Well, and what I was going to say, speaking of candles, candles are fantastic because <laughs> <laughs> when you think of it, so I'm, I'm, lighting, I'm, I'm lighting a candle for meditation, but like my brain's thinking about like the, the chores that I need to do and my kids and, and, and work and all of these different things. How am I supposed to focus on this silly little candle you know, looking at this thing, I'm using one of my senses, maybe two if it's got, you know, if it's got some kind of scent to it. But for the most part, I'm not engaging my senses. And, and when you're engaging yourself in mindfulness, you're engaging all of your senses. But it's really hard when you're just using one. And so one of the beautiful things about BDSM, and we'll pick on candles since you mentioned a candle, is, you know, wax play and candle play. You're incorporating all of your senses, although just as I know, don't use scented candles because those get really hot and they hurt. But <laughs> you can find other ways to incorporate scents. Well, you know, definitely but. more interesting use of candles. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm with you that, like, I, I, I guess like, for many people who are able to really participate in the experience of lighting the candle, doing mindfulness, which I'm always tell like I'm a student of it, I'm practicing it. But when there is an element of BDSM power exchange, it's significantly more charged and that can be more helping people to be staying more present. So again, depending on what practices people are using. So it's good that you are talking to us about that there is a, a galaxy of options when it comes to self-care and BDSM can be one of it. One of them. You told us about and we had people talking about BDSM and defining it in previous uh, several pre previous episodes. But tell us when you say BDSM, what, what are some of the things that falls under this umbrella? So let's test my memory. I'm, I'm terrible with acronyms. So BDSM, bondage, discipline, and sadomasochism is the traditional definition of BDSM that I use in most of my presentations. And so BDSM is really all about power exchange, even when you're doing it by yourself, <laughs> as silly as that might sound. But so the power exchange is beautiful and divine in that, you know, and one of the big things I like to do is normalize power exchange in BDSM. Because if you think about it, I'd be willing to bet money, nobody listening to this podcast can identify a relationship where there is zero power exchange. Mm -hmm. There's always power exchange. So it's, it's just kind of taking that and really defining it and being very intentional about that. And what I love about BDSM is there's just endless possibilities. It, it can be so creative. It can be everything from... When you think of, you know, your traditional American, like 50s model home where dad makes all the, you know, heteronormative, dad makes all of the decisions and mom stays home and cleans and, you know, that's a power exchange, you know, all the way up to, it can be super subtle where it's, I'm sorry, the secretary came to mind, the movie, the secretary, but like literally, <laughs> it, you know, a secretarial sort of, you know, I need you to do this, any kind of, I mean, it's, it can be anything and you can get creative with it. You know, one of the, one of my favorite things about BDSM is the, you know, the best place to shop for objects for BDSM is a hardware store. Uh, right. You know, your local Walmart or Target, you can find all kinds of great stuff. Um, you can get super creative about it and it can create all kinds of eroticism and intimacy and just fun energy that can liven up all kinds of different things. So 
it can be very complex all the way up to different categories where you've got, I mean, it can be like the leather and chains and bondage tying people up. And, you know, that can be as simple as taking your scarf off and tying up your partner's wrist, you know, all the way up to more incredibly complex things like, you know, equipment like St. Andrew's crosses that you tie somebody to and medical equipment. And I mean, it's this, endless sea of creativity and but it's the beautiful the most beautiful piece is you really don't actually need any equipment it can just be two people in their power exchange and me giving you permission to do different things to me and vice versa and when people telling me like when I talk about BDSN with clients they're talking about it with me and say oh I'm not into it I I often say it's what you just said that like it's a huge realm and uh, probably you are, you are in relationships that are power exchange at a time you do things in the bedroom that there is an element of power exchange there. So it's interesting that at times people, when they think about BDS and they have this very specific image, kind of a dynamic between, between people, that's not necessarily always the case. So if you guys listening to this podcast and think, oh, I, want, I might want to explore it, then you can look into an option that might speak to you. It might be a good fit for you. So when I'm talking to clients and we're introducing the concept of BDSM, there's a couple of good books that I like to recommend. The, the just, well, actually the number one book that I like to recommend is, I think it's called Spare Me the Roses, I Want the Thorns or Give Me the Thorns or something like that. Wow. And yeah, what's fantastic about it, it's like this blue and white book and it looks like a workbook and it's not very big. But what's fantastic about it is it literally covers like most of the major BDSM avenues and, and gives you just kind of a, a synopsis of everything. And it's, and it's not intimidating. It was literally the first book I ever read. or was, Well, let me back up. It, not, it was not the first one that I looked at because I looked at a few, but you know, back in my like super vanilla days before I started exploring this and working with clients on this, some of those other books were just kind of really daunting and like, oh my God, no, um, no, I'm not going to encourage people to do this. No, but Spare Me the Roses, I really, really loved because it's not, it's not threatening. And if you're not into something, then move to the next chapter. You know, it's, it's not a big deal. And it's in, you know, most of the clients that I've brought this book up to, when they look at it, they're like, oh, wow, you know, okay, I think I could be into a few of these. Or they look at it and they're like, yeah, no, it's just not me. And that's okay, too. Good, good recommendation. I'll check it out because at, at times I have vanilla clients that they ask about uh, the reading and resources. And I'll, I'll add that to the resources that I, that I have as well. So tell us, uh, what are some of the ways that people may find their healthier selves through BDS? And I know that was a, a central piece of the presentation. Yeah. So one of the other really neat things about BDSM that I just, I really adore is that in BDSM culture, you know, sure, you're going to have your cute little rope bunnies. They're the usually the younger girls that are super fit and super cute, you know. So you do still have, like, your rope bunnies. But what's really neat about BDSM is it's really not about how you look. It's what you can do. And that's so empowering. That's so strengths-based. I'm a social worker, and so we're all about going from a strengths-based <laughs> strength perspective. And, and that's what I love about this. So it's really not about what you look like, it's what you can do. And what's neat about that is everybody can do something. Mm -hmm. Everybody, no matter, you know, if your body is completely immobile, there's all kinds of fun psychological things that you can do, you know? And so it's really about reframing and finding that strength and building on it. And so, you know, if you do just a little bit of Googling, you know, you'll find blog post after blog post after blog post uh, and it's usually women. I didn't find many from a male perspective. And I believe most of them were cis female. I don't think I found any trans women that had indicated anything, but most of it was cis female that were talking about how they went from being these eating disordered people to through BDSM being able to see that like, wait a minute, like nobody cares if I'm curvy. Like nobody's mad about that. Nobody's judging me for not being a size two. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it's, it's usually larger women having some difficult, but even smaller, you know, smaller people mm -hmm. can have some, you know, body image issues and finding that peace and acceptance through BDSM. Because again, it's what can you do? You know, what are you capable of? What do you offer? And so what's neat about that is there's so many different realms of play that it isn't necessarily about how much pain can you tolerate and how hard can you hit? You know, 
if you're somebody who identifies with age play, you know, it's more about, you know, are you cutesy and little and do you like the color? Are you, you know, are you, are you a mommy or a daddy and do you like to care give? Which by the way, it's not all, it's not pedophilia or anything like that. I just mm-hmm. have to clear play with age play because it gets a bad rap. You know, it, that's about caring for someone, you know, that's a, that's a more caring power exchange. And so how can, you know, are you good at that? And, and so there's a lot of, are you good at tying things? That doesn't necessarily require a lot of standing or, you know, what have you. You can do it from a seated position. And, and so that's one of the great things about it. BDSM can also be really amazing for building your confidence. You know, if you're someone who was incredibly shy and, and just never felt like you had any control in your life, and then you start learning this skill. Because again, BDSM is about skill. Granted, aesthetics are there too, but... You know, when, when in the BDS community, BDSM community, when you're looking at who to play with and who you want to hang out with and how you want to do things, it's really about what people do because you don't want somebody that looks hot but is not safe. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you want that safe piece. And so that, that brings, when, so that, that requires that people be good at their skill. And so when you get good at your skill, you build confidence through that. You know, um, I mentioned in my presentation a couple that I worked with where it was a, it was a heterosexual com- couple and about four years in, he kind of just sprung BDSM on her and, and a power exchange relationship. She didn't know anything about it. He wanted her to dominate him. She identified if she was, and, and she'd even said in our sessions, like if I was going to have to pick a BDSM thing to do, it would be the 50s power exchange where I'm the housewife and he's the dom, but that's not what was thrust on me. Mm-hmm. And, and so... Through our work together, as she was, I like, she decided to embrace this role because she felt that you know, and and because he had said that he can't, he can't move forward without it, and she wanted to try to make it work, and so because she chose that route, we decided to explore what it would mean for her to embrace this role as his his dom, and so. In doing that, over the course of the, I think about a year and a half we worked together, she went from somebody whose social anxiety really immobilized her, which was complicated because of her career. She really needed to be able to go out. (laughs) But where, because she was gaining confidence in what she was doing, it was sort of spreading into other avenues. You know, and by the time we were done, she could easily plan a scene. She could do the scene. All of these things had petrified her at the beginning and would completely shut her down. She was going to work. She was networking for herself, getting out there and socializing, going places and advertising for herself, things that she wouldn't have done at the beginning, you know, and it really just helped her to blossom. And, you know, there are story after story after story within the BDS community, BDSM community about that, you know, where being able to really get good at your skill and get really good at that communication, because that's the other piece of it is in order to successfully navigate BDSM, you have to be good at communicating. It sort of forces you to. And learning, you know, that being able, learning how to have dialogue and, and hear people and, and be very clear and concise about what it is that you're doing can be incredibly empowering. What a wonderful story. And, and there were some elements of it out, and I could relate to what she was experiencing. Maybe I need to take one of those workshops for <laughs> being a dom. So I, that would hopefully help with my business too. But joking aside, I'm thinking about one of the, I had, I was thinking about a, one of the couples that I work with and the role that the partner wants the, uh, like the female, the other female to play is not something she finds attractive, sexy for her. Uh, I mm-hmm. seen this, di- it was a similar dynamic in a sense that the, the female partner was willing to lean into exploring this role of being a dom, although it wasn't her kind of part of her erotic template or what she was gra- gravitating toward. So is it possible for people to find pleasure on the roles that is not necessarily their primary choice? Yeah, absolutely. There is a concept of what they call like a service top. Well, let me, let me back up. So when you're, when you're talking about power exchange in your traditional power exchange sense, you usually have somebody who identifies as a top. So this would be like your dom, dominatrix, mommy, daddy, I'm blanking on, I know there are other names and I'm blanking on them right now, but that's going to be like your kind of in charge person is your top. Then you've got your bottom. So this is the person that's going to be the submissive. I'm not a fan of this language, but slave, your little, like your pet play. So like your puppy and your pony and your kitten. So those are going to be kind of your submissive. And then you have people who are switches and they can kind of float back and forth. They can be either or what have you. 
So in this con in all of these concepts, you've got like service service tops. And although some people will kind of give me side eye for saying this, there are also service subs. But basically, when you're a service top or bottom, what that means is that while you don't necessarily identify with this role, you gain pleasure from providing it to your partner. So let's say I have a partner who is probably a little bit more switchy, or maybe they're even a top, but I really, 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 really love this particular kind of BDSM scene thing where, where you know, it's a submissive or just a, a neutral person, and I really want to be dominated. So they would be a service top by dominating me because it's not something that they want to do all the time or something that they really connect with. It's, they're a little bit of role play for this one particular episode, and that's it. That's great that there there is a, this kind of way of looking at it that also makes it pleasurable for for the partner that's not necessarily that's their primary role. And I think when you talked about the body acceptance piece, it was it kind of like clicked for me. It's like oh, duh, that makes sense because one of the challenges that people have when they're struggling with eating disorders. Half of my practice is people who are struggling with my moderate to acute eating disorders. Is that they they don't see their body as, as a functional kind of tool. They see their body as just for aesthetic and kind of like using the body for giving and experiencing pleasure. It can be very transformative, as you mentioned, that you have, you've seen it in readings and with your clients. So what, how, did your, how did your clients that you work with find body acceptance using BDSM? Basically, so I've, I've, I've had a couple of situations where one particular client, actually several, but larger, yeah, probably larger women who were very insecure about their bodies, but in going into these play spaces repeatedly, one of the things you'll see if you go into a BDSM space is you're going to see a lot of nudity in varying stages. And so being around all of that and seeing all of that really normalizes the human form. Men and women alike, you're seeing people in different, from personal experience, I went to a venue and it wasn't even a BDSM venue, but there was an elderly man there all decked out in his leather gear. I wasn't expecting to see that, but you know, that was, because <laughs> again, it wasn't actually a BDSM event, it was a Halloween event, but that, you know, he was somebody from the community and that's how he chose to go to the party. <laughs> um, you know, but you, but at the events, that's, that's what you see. You're going to see people in various stages of undress and all body types and it's normal and nobody's being weird about it. It's, it's no different than if you're at the mall and everybody's running around fully clothed, mm -hmm. you know. People aren't sitting around like oogling each other or making comments or pointing or anything. If they are, it's about, they're talking about techniques. Mm -hmm. They're going over and saying, hey, show me how you crack that whip like that. You know, it's, how did you make that thing? You know, it's, it's not usually about the bodies. Or if it is about the body, it's like, hey, look at that bruise. Look at those cane marks. It's not package, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the focus is not necessarily on the shape. Yeah. And, and because you, you know, when you're going into this space and you're being exposed to this time and time, and you know, one time is not going to boom, I'm done. I went to a dungeon. I am no longer having body dysmorphia. It, no, <laughs> that's not how it works. You know, it, it's kind of like exposure therapy because you're going into these spaces and you're seeing all of these bodies and you're seeing how, wait, this is normal. And like going back and going back and, you know, finding, you know, Hey, let me, let me try maybe this time I'll take my shirt off. And nobody looked at me weird. In fact, I got invited to play. Whoa, this is crazy. So the next time I go back and then, you know, people slowly kind of starting to realize that it's okay. You know, I can find comfort in myself. Uh, what a, what an important point around kind of exposure piece, because when people are like more advanced in their eating disorder, they're not in starvation mode or they're, they don't do any binging and purging behavior, or if they're, they stop the binging behavior, one of the things we do is focus on self image. And one of the most challenging thing is to go out there to, to where you're bathing suit and swimming suit and go to the beach. And at times I do exposure with going with people in the community, in the beach. It's just so scary. And I totally understand that. But like this, this context of going to a dungeon, it, it would be very interesting 
twist to the, the traditional exposure. Obviously, I wouldn't go with them. I would sure. recommend them to go alone. <laughs> but uh, it would be kind of them kind of instead of focusing on only on kind of exposure of like being uh, naked or wearing less clothing, the focus is around the play. So hopefully mm-hmm. that can be a distraction for the intensity of the emotion that people are experiencing as it relates to their distress around their body and shape. Absolutely. And another piece to this is, is that, you know, especially when you're looking at, so when you're looking at the, and again, a lot of this is very heteronormative, but it, it really can be two women playing where one woman is, you know, the dom and the other is the submissive and as well as men. And it just, the, the gender roles, can be kind of a moot point in some of this, but the important piece is is that when somebody who is a submissive is having body dysmorphia issues, whether it's around size or differently abled appendages, a physical, any of that, you know, and, and they're bashing on themselves and their own judgment is incredibly harsh and distorted, you know, if they find a top or a dom that they really trust and they really build that relationship and they're really connected to that person, they can also start to shift some of how they view themselves by listening and trusting in with what the dom is saying. They can start to align with what that person sees. I have seen that happen where they couldn't trust their own judgment, but they could trust their doms. And so whether it's just a matter of safety or trusting the judgment or what have you. It's kind of creating, I'm a big fan of attachment theory. Mm-hmm. So in, in this space, if the dom can create a secure attachment with their insecurely attached submissive, then the submissive will learn to trust and love and all of these things through that bond. That, what an interesting way of uh, looking at it and conceptualizing it, which, which absolutely makes sense. And people's like, when they struggle with self-image issues, sometimes their cognition is distorted. And like I, I used to work at a lab, we were looking at the uh, neurobiology of brain and all of those things, which is very true that people's cognition can be compromised. But I love that you're talking about somehow these people through developing this attachment with someone else, they can, they, they can cultivate the ability of trusting that their own reality, in a sense, when it comes to their negative self images and negative self talks. So we are all, I would imagine, I'm excited, and I'm sure other people, like other listeners, are excited too. So if if people want to kind of explore this, kind of cultivate this, uh, they want to cultivate a positive body image using BDSM, but that but they're not necessarily in the community. This is not something that's part of their regular uh, sexual behavior. What would be some of the first steps that you recommend people to do? So when I'm bringing this up with clients, the first thing that I talk about is also that BDSM is not necessarily about sex. Power exchange is not necessarily about sex. There are multiple ways to play that do not involve sex at all. Pleasure does not have to equate sex, you know, and and so I like to start with that because I, I do work with a lot of clients who also identify as asexual. So the idea of sex, they're like, ah, no, <laughs> you know, so you know, and I work with, I'm, I'm in Texas, so I've got a lot of super conservative folks kind of coming in and, you know, bringing some of this up that kind of look at me like I'm a little off and that's okay. <laughs> I can work with that, <laughs> you know, but what I start talking to people about is, you know, because, and this is always going to be this, I'm not going to recommend this for somebody I've never met um, or somebody I've only seen a couple of times. So this is all going to be with clients that I know, I know their background. So when I bring it up with clients, I, I'm looking at, you know, what is their background already? I know them, I know what's going on with them. So I look for places where they're already implementing some things, but maybe they're just not aware <laughs> of it. So like a couple that I have that were already doing a 50s style household, instead of some of the passive aggressive things that were going on because of inadequate communication, how about we just put this on the table and entertain this? And so we started with exploring different books. There's a lot of really good books out there about BDSM. I like to start with education before I start talking about community support. So let's, let's start reading. And a lot of these books are available on Audible. So if people don't like reading, they can listen. So just like I already mentioned, Spare Me the Thorns. When we're talking just some basic power dynamics, um, Dossie Easton, and mm-hmm. Janet Hardy. No, is it Janet Hardy? I always mess up on her last name, uh, their last name. They've got a couple of good books out there. there. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's also some really good podcasts. There's some really good uh, YouTube videos. And then there's kink.com. Now, you do have to pay for that. It's not free. But they 
talk about all kinds of different stuff. They give instructional videos, all kinds of things. So a lot of my clients don't necessarily want to go into the community because they're teachers or other therapists or, you know, they have roles that if it were to be discovered, they were into this kind of stuff, it could be compromising. This is a real thing. Um, and it can be problematic for some people. I fully recognize that. Stigma is a, one of the other pieces that I educate about a lot. But when people don't want to do that, that's when I really kind of push for things like kink.com. It's not that expensive. I think it's only like 100 and it's less than 150 a year for a membership. And for the training that they give, that's, it's super, super important. Um, safety is a big deal. So that's one thing that we look at. Now, if they are open to going into the community, then one of the things that I suggest is they go and find what's called a munch. And so a munch is, it's vanilla. It's usually held at a restaurant, in a public space. Everybody wears their just everyday gear. Sometimes they're family friendly. So they keep it super vanilla, super low key. Um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just a meet and greet. And you can find those by, there is um, a website called meetup.com. And usually if you just go in and kind of Google, or not Google, but like search your community and, and keywords like BDSM, kink, there, if you know what kind of kink you're into, you can also do a search for that specific kink in that area. Most of your major metropolitan areas are going to have groups already active, so you'll be able to find them. And then you just contact them and you let them know that you want to come to these munches. They're usually open to the public. Sometimes they may want to do, uh, they may want to vet you. And so basically what that means is they might want to talk to you to make sure that you're safe. They, they don't want people that are predatory or people that are going to be problematic or a police sting or something like that that's going to scare people. Things like that do happen, so they have, they have to be cautious. And so, and let, me, and let me also, and when I say things like police sting, I'm not trying to be scary or anything, but in a lot of states, a lot of what goes on with BDSM is technically illegal. But then again, in a lot of states, Oral sex is still illegal, so <laughs> our laws have not caught up with the times. You know, there are organizations, if anything like that ever were to come up, there are organizations like NCSF, the National Coalition for Sexual Freedom, who do a lot of research and advocacy and actually have legal teams. So if anything were to ever come up, law enforcement involved, CPS involved, Child Protective Services, or anything like that, um, they have really good resources to help people with that. So, and that's so that can be a really good resource. But anyway, back to the original question. So I start with encouraging them to check out things like munches. Now there is a website called fetlife.com that it's kind of like Facebook for kinksters. I do caution people about it because it can be, <laughs> it can be intimidating. Um, you're going to see stuff uh, right there on your computer and you don't want to do it from work. Oh, heavens no. Don't do <laughs> it from work. Uh, <laughs> Unless your employer happens to be like me and doesn't care about that kind of stuff. But uh, at your average Joe job, don't do that. But FetLife.com can be a place where you can do, you can meet other people who are into all kinds of other things. The vetting on Facebook isn't super, I mean, they have, they have some vetting. It's not super tight. So sometimes there are bad people on there. And so you do need to be cautious about that. But as far as finding community, always, 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 always. Always go to a public munch. Do not go to a private event. You always want to start with a public munch. That way you have a chance to meet people. You can get a feel for if it's safe. You can meet the admins of that organization or group. Here in the Dallas area, we have a wonderfully thriving kink community. Um, and so we've got things like Fourth Friday. It's held at a big restaurant and it's a giant event and there'll be tons of people there. And so I encourage a lot of my clients to look for that kind of event. Um, because, you know, I've talked with the, I've talked with the people who run those groups and they're really inclusive and they'll talk to people and they'll explain things and it's safer that way. But anyway, as you're kind of doing some of these things, if there's, you know, play spaces in your local community, like here in the Dallas area, we have a couple of dungeons. Austin has a couple, I think. I'm not sure. I know they used to. I don't know if they still do. Houston does, you know, um, like the Philadelphia area. They've got a great scene from what I hear. Um, you know, and just all over the Metroplex, or not Metroplex, all over the U.S., there's all kinds of great stuff. So look for what you've got. And then once you have that, you, once you've been to the munches, you can see, you know, what kind of things go on. And oftentimes, some of the dungeons may have, um, they'll have educational opportunities where you can go in. Queer, looking in queer spaces can also be a great place to look. The leather community got its roots in the, the gay male community. 
or it's, it has really strong roots there. I don't know if I'd say got its roots, but it has strong roots there. So typically speaking, in most major metropolitan areas, they're going to have usually a club oftentimes called the Eagle. That is, it's a, it's usually, it's a gay male club, but they oftentimes will have BDSM things going on. Um, so it can be a good place to kind of start getting a feel for things, it's, you know, especially if you happen to be a gay man, but you don't have to be a gay man to go do these things. Um, oh, there's also, so for, if you're a professional and you are anxious about participating in any kind of the BDSM scene in your area, usually in na- neighboring metropolitan areas or even the next state over, Um, There'll be all kinds of events and things. Just look for what's a reasonable drive for you. And then nationwide, actually worldwide, but nationwide, there are kind of like, there there are BDSM 101 events. Like here in the Dallas area, we typically have uh, Beyond Vanilla. Um, This year got canceled, but they should be back in 2020. Colorado, oh gosh, I can't think of what it's called. They they, They presented a couple years ago at the ASEC conference, and I can't think of what they're called. I want to say... I think they have a conference called Thunder in the Mountains or something like that, but they're nationwide. And so if you just do sort of like research, you know, Google like BDSM conference, you know, Atlanta has a pretty thriving scene and they've got different events and things going on. So they're a great place. And usually they have one-on-one kind of geared classes. So like beyond vanilla, they'll have great stuff on everything from like how to navigate can, you know, consent and contracts and, you know, puppy play and, you know, how to build your own equipment and toys and just super basic stuff. You know, Dossie Easton was there a couple years ago. I happened to go sit in on hers and I was really glad I did because she did a really neat kind of developing your inner, oh, what did she call it? I can't remember. It was a workshop um, where you developed sort of your inner kinkster basically. Oh, very and so she, her classes. she's really cool. Yeah. So it was like a little mindfulness exercise that you visualize like, what your inner inner kinkster is, whether it's a submissive or a dominant, and it's just really neat. But yeah, no, it's really good stuff. Well, I love the number of resources that you mentioned. <laughs> this is great. So if people are interested, these are wonderful, good ways to start. And I'm with you that I think education is a key because sometimes people have this abstract idea of, or wrong idea about what BDSM might look like or they're not aware of the, like, the importance of safety. So it's, it's good to start with the education and also learn from people who are already doing it and kind of get some information before acting on and kind of like introducing and doing these scenes. Absolutely. Safety first, always safety first. <laughs> so Elizabeth, I know that you, you, this is your, the work that you're doing, working with clients, uh, I would imagine part of your work and helping them to work through some of the challenges that they have through use of BDSM. So if people want to get access to you, they want to contact you, what are some of the good ways to reach out? So in my practice, we have five therapists. We are all kink and poly aware. Um, some of us are a little bit more savvy than the others, and that's okay. Everybody's learning and growing, but it's kind of our little safe haven that we've tried to create here in the Dallas area. And our website is realisticexpectations.net. So you can get in touch with myself or any of the other therapists in my office. And we have a really great diverse staff that I'm super proud of and I'm super honored to work with. Actually, I'm honored that they work with me. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just realisticexpectations.net. All of my contact information is on the, I think it's get in touch with us page. I think is what it is. Fax is there, email, phone number, the whole nine. Excellent. Excellent. I leave a link in the show notes so people can, can, can contact you if you're interested. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being so generous with all this information and experiences that you cultivated throughout several years. Uh, it was definitely my pleasure to have you on the show. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye. I hope you guys got some great ideas about what can you do for self-care if you're someone that uh, more traditional forms of self-care is not speaking to you, perhaps BDSM would be a good way of kind of incorporating more of the fun adventure in your life. At the end, I wanted to remind you guys that I have been writing weekly blog posts and I've been kind of contributing to different 
online blogs and a publication. So if you're interested to learn more about uh, what I'm writing, and I'm usually writing either about psychology of food or psychology of sex, you can always sign up for my newsletter. You can find it at sexologypodcast.com. I love to be in touch. I'll promise you I'm not going to overwhelm you with too many emails. Thank you. And I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.